Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Well, look, so we're still in Romans chapter 6. Tonight, um, I just titled tonight, We Died With Him. Uh, we've, we've covered already quite a bit of ground. We started in Romans 3. We went into 4 and 5. We've already hit 6. We talked a lot about 6 and in chapter 6 about did you not know that those of us were baptized into Christ Jesus were also baptized into his death and that we've been buried with him. And just as he was raised from the dead, we too should walk in newness of life. And so that's, and, and really the whole theme of Romans 6 has to do with the fact that the old man that we were has died with Christ. And we, we need to understand that the concept there is not just about that the penalty's been paid, but that, but that this is also how we have victory in Christ, okay? So when we're talking about Romans chapter 6, we're really talking about sanctification, okay? What does sanctification mean? It's describing the word sanctified itself uh, in the Greek language has a two-part meaning. Number one, it's that you're holy, uh, and then number two, it's that you've been separated, okay? So I need you to understand that you, you and I both know that you nor I are holy because of what we do, but instead it's because God is willing to recognize our new position as being found in Christ based on faith. I hope that makes sense to you tonight. And then listen, it might make a lot of sense intellectually, or it might make sense because you've heard it repetitively. Whatever the case, it might make sense in your mind. But what you need to understand is this, is that there's a place in the walk of the believer that as he begins to hear these truths spoken that the Holy Spirit can take it from here and put it right here. And when the Holy Spirit takes it from just an intellectual understanding to a, to a heartfelt revelation, then what ends up happening is, is that you begin to feel the grace of God flowing and moving in your life, right? And you've heard me talk about the definition of grace before and how it's a divine influence, meaning God influences the inner man, a divine influence on the heart, which is the inner man, and it's reflection in the life. That's the beauty of the message of the cross. Not only will it tell you how Jesus has already done it for you and tell you to keep your faith there, but as you do that, what you should start noticing in your own lives. Listen, some people aren't going to ever want to agree with you that you're being changed, but you and I both know that, that we can also many times see ourselves, and sometimes we might get frustrated if we feel like people don't see change in our lives, but I just want to encourage you, you're not here to impress your mama, your daddy, your brother, your sister, your best friends at work. That's not what you're here. You're here to, to, to serve the Lord, amen, and to submit yourself to God, and one of the beautiful things about we call it the message of the cross or the message of the finished work of the Christ or the New Testament truth or whatever, that being found in Christ does a lot, that makes a radical change in the heart and the life of the believer. And you, you and I need to understand this. Listen, many people, their New Testament understanding of God has to do with the stuff that they think that they're not supposed to do. But yet, every, it's easy for us to find things that we don't do and then we judge other people for what they do. Like, I mean, listen, I don't know if anybody in here specifically smokes cigarettes or not. If you do, I'm not trying to pick on you. But I will say this, you know, look, if somebody, if you ever got into a car with somebody that just smoked a cigarette and you don't smoke cigarettes, it kind of don't smell all that good, right? And it's very easy if that frustrates you, kind of like back when I used to dip skull or something and I'd have my little dip cup and it kind of, like, I couldn't even smell it, but other people around me were like, dude, that stuff is disgusting. And so whenever you smell something like that on somebody or you see a sin that you consider to be disgusting, you just kind of like wrinkle your little nose up at them and you look down on them and you're like, hmm, I thank God I ain't doing that no more. But what is it that you do do, my friend? Because, see, if your heart isn't right and you're, and you're puffed up in your own mind and thinking that you're, that you're doing so well with Christ, the Bible explicitly says this. And listen, if you don't hear something Anything else I say tonight, I want to make sure we're clear on this. And this is just as much for me as it is for you. The Bible says you ought not think more highly of yourself than what you ought to. And I don't know about you, but I think we all in this room, if we're honest with one another, we have struggled with that at one point in time of our life. Amen? Scripture also says that God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourself, therefore, into the mighty hand of God, that in due time he might exalt you. So what I know is this, is that if I'm prideful and I think that I'm something that I'm really not, then guess what? God will resist that because that's pride. But if I humble myself and understand, because, you know, the scripture also says to prefer your brother more than yourself. 
So that be, that, listen, that's not something that you can just manufacture. That's a heartfelt spiritual thing that's taking place in your heart that allows you to understand that other people in the faith, they might be struggling, they might not be exactly where you are, but you also, one of the beautiful things about the message of the cross, it'll also allow you to see yourself. Because see, whenever you really start to, to, to trust in the word of God, the Holy Spirit will begin to reveal yourself to you. And that's humbling in and of itself. Yes. You see, that's humbling in and of itself, right? And, and, and so anyway, I just want to, I want to let you know, though, that, that that's just some of the basic things that, that uh, you know, I started off talking about. But tonight we're, we're talking about we died with him. So the first scripture, I wanted to bring you back to Romans 6 and verse 10, just because I really wanted to kind of re- review again Romans 6 and 11. So I wanted you to see here, it says, for in that he died, he died unto sin once, I was going to try to see if I could use my little pencil tonight and see if that works. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. So we, we, we know that the Lord's not, he died unto sin once. We know that the Lord is not to be uh, persistently crucified. You know, the, the Catholic Church, part of the Mass says that it, it's, it, he's being crucified again and again, you know. Um, but, but the reality of it is, is that Jesus died unto sin once and he died unto sin for all really jesus has already paid the penalty for the sins of humanity right and so the question is will each individual receive it for themselves and so not only did he die for sin once but he also lives amen he's living unto the lord and so whenever we talked about this verse so so because jesus died unto sin once and he lives unto god then the word of god now says so likewise just at just like jesus Likewise, just as Jesus died unto sin once, you ought to also reckon your own selves to be dead unto sin. And that was the, we talked about that word reckon uh, last week. And, and we talked about the fact that if this is what God says, you know, I was thinking about this earlier. This is what God believes. Amen. That, that, look, whenever people want to communicate, have you ever, you, know, you ever thought about that? Like, what, yeah, I know you have. You're in a conversation with someone. And you're, in, you're just talking about things, and they're sharing with you their thoughts on life, right? They, share, they might share with you what they believe about work uh, or what they believe about politics or what they believe about religion, right? And so what you're doing is as you're communicating with this person, what's happening? You're beginning to learn what they believe. Amen. So a way a person might uh, explain what they believe is through communication. Communication can come in verbal form, but it can also come in written form. I was just thinking today how God in his word, we understand it's his word, and so it's his communication. But God is communicating to us what he believes. And this is what God believes. God believes that Jesus died for sin once and that he, and that he now lives unto God. Amen. And so because God believes that and it was written in his word, what God also believes is that you and I, likewise, just as Jesus died unto sin once and now lives unto God, that you and I, just like Jesus, we need to see ourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. Now, remember, whenever we're talking about sin right there, I need to, I need to remind you, I don't know if this is going to work, but this is supposed to be the sin. You remember that? The sin, the power of sin, we're talking about the noun of sin, ha hamartia. Remember, I showed y'all that, the, the, the definite article in the Greek language. This is not talking about the verb of sin. And the, the reason that this is important is because many times in our walk with God, or we imagine in our hearts and minds the things that we're not supposed to do. Right? I mean, you, I, you don't need me to, li- to list it off to you. You know in your own heart and mind the things that you know you're not supposed to do because the Lord's already dealt with you about it. But, but those are the actions of sin, right? Those are the verb aspects of sin. So what I need you to understand is when you're talking about the power of sin, you're talking about the power that's behind it, the force that's pushing you and I to move towards that very thing. Is it demonic? Absolutely. The whole thing having to do with sin is demonic. But the question is, and you know, look, and and I I hope nobody takes this the wrong way, but I've been, and I've mentioned this before, and I really want to start digging into it more, but, uh, but the concept of deliverance ministry and and you know i remember one time robert said that he went to a, a a service like that actually i think he went to a deliverance service and the woman he had bell's palsy and the woman laid hands on him and and he was healed of that i want to kind of start digging around and looking into that a little bit more i've watched a lot of videos but i do want to make some some points 
that, that yes, the power of sin is always demonic, but what, I, but what I want you to see right here is the Bible's testimony of how a person walks in victory over the power of sin. So if a person is struggling with sin and they are a true believer, okay, again, does that mean that they have a demon in them or on them or whatever, or is it that the power of sin has regained power in their life? And the question is, how is it do we find freedom in that instance? I'm going to tell you that some of those videos that I watched, I didn't agree with a lot of what was said. But at the same time, there were some elements to it that I was like, I think this needs to be explored a little bit more, at least in my heart and in my mind. I want to try to dig a little bit deeper to understand some things. But what I do, I, the only reason I brought that up is because I think we got a few different people in here that that have watched some of those same type of videos and, and, and understand that. I'm, the only reason I'm bringing that up for you guys is so that you understand that this chapter is talking about how the power of sin is to be dealt with. So that's why I bring that up, so that we're all on the same page, okay? And so, so he says that you and I are to see ourselves as dead unto sin. So what, that, what does that mean to the, to, the new, to the new believer that doesn't understand anything about what it means to be in Christ and, and how his power source comes from the Lord. If he doesn't understand that, then he just perpetually struggles, okay, in his walk with God because he doesn't know what to put his faith in. Now, let's just use this as an example. For the longest time, whenever I first got saved, and I've shared this with you before, but I got a point. Whenever people, listen, 95% of the people in the church are struggling. Now, now I'm not talking, it's one thing if, you fa if you're falling short. We all fall short. But I'm talking about 95% of the people in the church. I'm using, using that statistical number. I don't have proof on it because, I mean, it'd be almost impossible to get the numbers. But my point is, is that a lot of people are really struggling in the Lord. Okay, and so, so, the, so the question is, whenever people struggle and they feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit, they want to know, how is it that I get free, right? Is that fair enough? I mean, if you've been in the faith for any length of time, you yourself have asked that question. Whenever I was new to the faith, didn't really understand this Romans chapter 6, what I would do is I would make promises to God. Tomorrow's the last day, Lord. The, the dip is getting thrown out the window. Okay, uh, we're not going to go on and on about that. Okay, how many promises did I make to God? How many promises did I break to God? Okay, I need to pray more, right? Because if I pray enough, then I'm finally going to be free. And my motives, I thought, were right. Okay, I need to go to church more. W well, the church that I used to go to, what they believed, and many of the people in that church believed, was that you were going to get a touch from the man of God. And so whenever the altar call came, people would line up in, the, in, the, in lines, and, and they would just walk up, and the man of God would would touch them and sometimes they would fall down sometimes i'm just gonna be real with you he was pushing on your head a little bit but that's another story that's between him and the lord it's not that's not as important but but what but anyway i would go up there many a times and and, and i would go to receive prayer because i wanted to be free and i'm using dipping as an example but i really wanted to be free from dipping at that point in time in my life and, you know, he would do his thing. He would lay his hands on me. And, I mean, I, went, I was just, after a while, after 15 times, I'm like, dude, this is, okay, I'm just going to the store and get another can of dip. Because it's like, it wasn't, I wasn't really ever becoming free. But I was, like, going through the same motions time and again, right? And I was being told that the object of my faith, and listen, I'm just going to say, if we're not careful, deliverance ministry can become that for people. They can begin to put their faith in deliverance ministry. And so I just want to point that out. And that doesn't mean that anybody's doing that, but what I am saying is people can do that. They can put, they can begin to believe that the only way to victory is that a devil has to be cast off or out of someone, but what, that's not what the Bible says in the book of Romans chapter 6. Now, let's be clear. The power of sin is demonic okay and there's a de demonic entity that's connected to this but let's see what the book of romans says and right here it's saying listen you need to reckon yourself likewise just as jesus died once in the sin but lives unto god you likewise need to reckon yourselves in other words you need to begin to see yourself as dead to the power of sin and alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that's one of the things I'll, I'll, we talked about the last time about identification. Me, meaning, what is my identity? Amen. And what we talked about was the fact that we receive a new identity in Christ. 
And I even tried to bring up, and, you know, sometimes I'm worried that somebody's going to misunderstand me. But, you know, we're just, we're going to be a church that tries to tell the truth. And if you ever bring friends with you and I say something that you think offended them, then guess what? You get to tell, talk to them a little bit after church, and you can try to better explain it to them. Okay? But it's not like I don't try to explain it while I'm up here. And what I talked about was, you can't find a better illustration than A-A-N-A or Al-Anon, whatever you want to call it, okay? All of these self-help programs. You can't find a better uh, illustration because when you're in N-A or A-A, what do they tell you? My name's Matt, and I'm an addict, I'm an addict or an alcoholic. And so, and you know, that's just one of the things, listen, I, I didn't really plan on saying any of this, but let me just say this. I think that that's why in, in bigger churches, these recovery program classes have such a big attendance because it's scratching an itch that people have. Now, listen to me. And I just thought about this the other day. And I think I'm right. You may not agree, but I think I'm right. You know what all these people have in common? You know, listen, let me back up a second. The first time I ever ran a marathon, I signed up for a half and I ended up upgrading to a whole, which was a big mistake. I don't recommend you do that. But nevertheless, I finished it. But before we started, I noticed something. There was a bunch of men wearing tutus, ballerina tutus, men wearing tutus, people dressed up with little things. And I was like, what's up with this? So I started kind of questioning, well, these are just, these are avid marathon runners. This is what they, it's a little community. It's a little community of people that have something in common. And they just kind of play around with it and do whatever the case. And so, and so what it is, it's a, and they have something in common. And what they have in common is that they're all marathon runners, okay? And they just do weird little things, and it's just a joke to them, and I didn't understand it. But, you know, that's what they did, okay? Uh, uh, you know, and uh, I, wrote, I wore my little shirt that I got from Home of Christian on the back. It said his, I, I should have wore it on the front, though, because I, I was in behind the line. But anyway, it said, his blood, his sweat, your salvation. So I wanted people to see the message. So that, but, but the, the point that I'm trying to make is this, is that that was their community. That's what they had in common. They all ran marathons. And what I need you to understand is the little itch that people in bigger churches are getting scratched. And this is the problem. This is how they identify themselves. They're still identifying themselves. See, we all have this thing in common. What is it that we have in common? We were all addicts and we were all alcoholics. And so we need a special class that we can go to where we, and, and what happens is, is that now we got this open forum and we can sit here and we can talk about the problems that we're facing that our addictions and our alcoholism have caused us. I got news for you, boo. You don't have to be an alcoholic or an addict to have problems in your life. I got friend, news for you. You don't have to have all those issues to still have pain and suffering and heartache. But listen to me. If you are a new creation in Christ Jesus, then you got something different to look to and to have in commonality. And that is the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's what makes us... Our common union, our communion with one another is that we've become one with him. I hope that makes sense to you. Now, listen, I, I'm all about small groups and, you know, but if they, we ever had a class like that and have to have, have somebody trying to head it up, that first of all, we ain't using no recovery Bible, <laughs> okay? But secondly, we're not working as steps. I don't have a problem with people coming together and talking, and, and I don't even have a problem with people sharing, hey, look, man, I'm going through this. Well, look, when I went through this, this is what I, you know, trusting in the Lord and praying for. I'm good with all that. That's partly can be fellowship. But if we're coming together and we're saying, man, this is what we got in common, dude. We addicts and we alcoholics and we all, and we, but, and then we had a church maybe where they're not really teaching them the truth of who, what you're, you're supposed to identify yourself with. What did you see? Because you're not an alcoholic if you're in Christ. But, but I drank yesterday. I don't care if you drank a whole fifth of whiskey yesterday. According to God, what he wrote, what he communicated, he said, likewise, reckon yourself to be dead unto sin, but alive unto God through Christ Jesus our Lord. That's what you need to start identifying with. That's your identification. Amen? Amen. Praise God. I know Robert will appreciate this. And I just tell stories because I don't really have, you know, I don't know like Brother Swagger and been in ministry for 50 years. But one time whenever Rob and I went to, uh, 
went to prison ministry. I pulled, you remember that old checkbook Bible I had in my back pocket? <laughs> I pulled, we had to, they had to search our Bibles. I pulled my, my little checkbook Bible out, and, he, and he, they, Rob made fun of me because when they, they told me to shake it and whatever, and all my stuff fell out of there. Like I had my license in there. I had, and, then, and, I, and they started laughing at me. And I was like, look, dude, this, see, the reality of it is I don't have a Bible right here, but I would like just pretend that this is a Bible. I said, see, this is my identity. This is my ID card. This is who I am because this is what God says I am. And this is what I choose to believe. So that's my wallet and that's my identification. Amen. And, and I mean, I, you know, I, w- I would use that kind of stuff to just kind of stir my own soul up, right? To remind myself that I am a new creation in Christ Jesus. So I just want you to see that. I want you to, and listen, that's a big part of the faith of walking in victory is to start to understand, look, That's who I used to be, but the Word of God says, this is who I am today. And listen, even along the way, when you fall short of the glory of God, don't let the devil lie to you and keep you out of the house of God or keep you away from the things of God, because guess what? The blood of Jesus still makes you right in the eyes of the Father. Amen? And you're welcome in the house of God. Hallelujah. And if if somebody ever makes you feel unwelcome, let me know so that I can have a talk with them. Because, and if I ever make you feel unwelcome, Welcome, please let me know so that you can have a talk with me and God can have a talk with me. Amen? All right, hopefully that makes sense. So then he goes on to say this, let not sin therefore. Well, what's the therefore, therefore? Because likewise reckon yourself to be dead unto sin. You need to understand that you're dead in Christ and alive in Christ to God. So therefore, you should not let sin reign in your mortal body. We already talked about that in Romans 5, about reigning. Just as sin reigned unto death, even so might grace reign unto righteousness, uh, uh, through righteousness unto eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So whenever sin is reigning, it, it, the idea is, is that sin is a king in your life, and it's commanding, it's barking orders, and you are obeying it. So what the Word of God says right here is, is that if you let sin reign in your mortal, you're obeying it. You're obeying sin, okay? And, and, And what the Word of God wants you and I to know is that we don't have to do that. We don't have to obey sin, amen, because he's not our king. So again, let me just say this. If sin, if the sin is making it, the idea is that it's a noun, then what I need you to know is, is that here it's actually adding because a noun is a person, place, or thing. Then by saying reign, it's like they're putting a crown on top of sin, so they're making him a king, because that's what reigning is. It's like a king, so it's personifying sin. It's making it almost like he's a person. So he's a person that has authority in your life. But what I need you to understand is that sin is not king in your life. Jesus is king in your life if you're a believer. Amen. And you and I, by the grace of God, can obey the Lord, and we, not, we do not have to obey the, the, the word of God, I mean, the, the, the words of the enemy, amen? So, so this next scripture that we're going to talk about has to do with, the, it uses the word yield. And here it is. It says, neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness. Now, there's a lot in this scripture to unpack. But yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. <laughs> so I did a little bit of research on the yield sign, and I can't even remember what city it was in, but it was a police officer that came up with the yield sign because there kept on being accidents at this one particular intersection. But the idea of the yield is that you're giving you're recognizing that someone else has the right of way and you're giving them your permission. You're stopping and you're, or slowing down and you're allowing them to have their opportunity to, to move forward or to go ahead of you, right? And, and that's kind of what the idea here is saying is that you shall not yield or give permission for, the, for sin to move and to operate in your lives. There's a lot of different ways that this can manifest itself in our lives. Amen. I mean, if you and I are honest with one another long before we ever committed the sin that we knew that God didn't want us to commit the sin, he was already warning us not to go to a particular place, not to be around a particular person, not to look, not to do, you know, before we ever did it. So in reality, he could have averted, we could have averted by the grace of God, the situation or the scenario to begin with, had we listened to the Lord on the front end. Now, 
with that said, I understand that many times with the power of sin that the temptation is very, can be sometimes very, very great. And, and I just want you to understand this, that many times whenever the power of the sinful nature has inflamed itself and it's awake and it's, and it's powerful in your life, you may even know all of these things, and at that moment in time, you may find it so difficult to move forward. Now, do you think I'm giving you a license to sin? Because if you think I'm saying that, then you're, you don't know me very well. But what I am trying to say is this. You will know the difference whenever the message of the cross goes from being intellectual to revelational because you will have the power, the grace of God working on the inside of you to say, you know what? Nope, I ain't going there. I ain't going there. Now, one of the things that I have realized through the years and hopefully this makes some sense, is that, uh, you know, we used to, we used to kind of like, not say make jokes, but we used to kind of like talk about it in the early days of the Bible study. Sean used to make the comment, take another lap, because and it, what he was talking about was kind of like the football coaches used to tell you that, right? When you'd mess up, take another lap. But he was talking about the exodus, how the children of Israel had to go around one more time. And it's like whenever we keep falling and failing to get, t- take another lap. Take another lap. Rand used to say, come on, man. Just, And he wasn't trying to say that we should do this. It was like he was trying to verbalize the way he was seeing it in his eyes. God rest his soul. He would say, he would say take the sin challenge. You know, j- just go ahead. I dare you. Take it. One more. Like, in other words, thinking you're going to be able to just nibble a little bit one more time, it don't work that way. Whenever you open the door to it and you take a little nibble, the next thing you know, it's got power in your life again, okay? And then I can remember, I can remember that the Lord showed me one time whenever I was asking him, Lord, why? And he just said, because people many times are willing to sip it one more time. And until we get to the place where it becomes more painful, I think Sabrina made a comment one time, when it goes from being your friend to your enemy, she's not here tonight, but she usually comes over here. When it goes from being your friend to your enemy, then many times we're willing Amen. By the grace of God, uh, to, to, to give in and to surrender to the Lord and to his will. And then we'll see the Lord moving and operating in our lives. I hope that makes sense. So, so don't give permission for your members to be instruments of unrighteousness but unto sin. But instead, you need to yield yourself or give permission to yourselves to, to, unto God. As those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Now, see, for me, I wanted to just take a second to talk to you about this word instrument that's being used here, at least in, these, in this verse, uh, two different times. But let's also uh, circle the word members, okay? Because this word members is being used a couple of times here also. And so the first thing that I would want you to understand is that the, the word members, and many of you already probably know this already, but the word members means what? Body parts, Right? So the word members means body parts. So, I mean, that, that would, would include your eyes. That would include your ears, right? That would include your, it could include your lungs. It definitely could include your lips, your hands, your feet. I mean, there's a whole lot of damage already that I just described that can take place with these members of your body parts, right? Because it's your feet that bring you to the place you should either go or not go. It's your hands that manipulate whatever it is that's going to get you to the place where you should either, like, to manipulate the bad thing or the good thing. You can use your hand to pick up something that you're not supposed to pick up, but you can also use your hand to pick up the Word of God. Amen? Pray, that's what I'm trying to say. So the members have to do with your body parts. With the same lips that you can curse God, the same lips you can give glory to God. With the same lips that you can tear someone down and find all the faults with them and all the negative things that are connected to them. With them same lips, you can lift them up and you can give them encouragement and strength. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not into fake stuff. If I'm not really doing that good, don't tell me I am. But that's just me. Maybe you like it different. Maybe you like my marshmallow fluff fluff. I don't know what you like. Now, but, if, but, I mean, if I'm doing something, if you can see, I'm at least giving it the good old college try. I mean, don't beat me down, right? Try, to, try if you can find some kind of way to encourage a brother or a sister in the Lord. Besides that, you're supposed to. But, again, don't make it fake, my friend. Uh, because there, I've seen it before. Look, I don't know why I got to feel like I got to tell you all this. But one time I flew to... To Dallas, I believe it was. No, it was in Indiana. Indiana with, with my old pastor. If you happen to be watching, I'm sure you're not. But and we flew over there to Indiana, and we stayed. We were in Indianapolis. Stayed in the same hotel together. But there was these, we ran into these guys beginning in the, in the airports 
we ran into Marvin Gorman. That was interesting. Yeah, everybody remember Marvin Gorman? But we ran into a couple other guys. This one dude, he's kind of still big in the state of Louisiana. I'm not going to get into all that. Okay, so, but we ran into a couple other pastors. And I just, I'm just saying, the fakery was coming off of these guys. I don't know if y'all got a fake alert in y'all, but I got a fake alert in me. And if that's the kind of preacher y'all like, go find him. Because you ain't, by the grace of God, you ain't going to get that from me because I ain't wanting to be fakery. I want to be who I am, and I want you to see what you get, right? And so, but, dude, it was just oozing off of these guys. And, and they, they tell each other what they want to hear. Oh, man, you're just, you're killing it, dude. You're so, you're so awesome, man. You're, you know, and I'll never forget, I'm like, I'm like, so what are we doing, man? We're voting for some new grand poobah of the Assemblies of God or the National, whatever, whatever. And so the pastor that I was with, I, he was like, hey, man, who are you thinking about voting for? And he's like, well, you know, that other dude's the old guy. So you, that, that's scary right there. Whenever young people don't want older people that have been serving the Lord around them, then we got a, Houston, we got a problem. The true body of Christ should be a mixture of people that have been serving the Lord. Because guess what, young folk? We can learn something from the older people. And guess what? If we're not a relevant church because we ain't got no young people in our church, then Lord help us. Because the reality of it is, is that you still need the old people. Although I'm looking at we got some, we got some young people in the church, so that's a good thing. All right, because a lot of times young people may be some Sometimes think they know more than what they really know, right? Okay. Anyway, so he says, he says, hey man, who you who you voting for? He said, well, I'm voting for the young dude from Cali. And, I, and so and so so the pastor Brad Brad says, well, well, what's he all about? Well, he's just like you, man. He's just like you, dude. He's he's moving and shaking, and you see what I'm trying to say. But it was so, and I had to ask him. I'm like. I'm like, dude, let me ask you a question, bro. You don't feel something wrong with that? Like, like, well, what you talking about, man? I'm like, what am I talking about? You don't feel that coming off of that dude? Dude, it's fakery. It's like it's a facade. It's not even, it's not real. And he's like, well, yeah. He knows. He can feel it. But look, that's what they do. How did I get into that? I don't know. Uh, I mean, I'm talking about your body parts, and I'm talking, about, I'm talking about your mouth, and I'm talking about encouragement. And then I said, it's good to encourage your brother or sister in the Lord, but don't make it fake. Amen? All right. Praise God. Because you know, look, you know what the word fake is? The word fake comes, is kind of the idea behind hypocrite. Because you know what the word, the word in the Greek for hypocrite is hypocritos, and it means an actor on the stage with a mask. That's the literal definition. Yeah. So, 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 so whenever you're acting a certain way and it's not real, you're really faking it. All right. But anyway, so your body parts. Your body parts can be used for sin or unrighteousness, and your body parts can be used for God or for righteousness. And as a matter of fact, look, the word instrument right there, this is so cool. The first time I found this out, the word instrument literally in the Greek means a weapon of warfare. Dude, that's powerful. So if you, if you go back to your old life, whoever you were, I mean, I can look at some of you guys, and I know a little bit about some of your past. But, like, it's, you know, look, some of us, when we were in the world, we were literally working for the devil. Like, I'm just saying, like, I wasn't a high-level guy like some of these dudes up in this house. But I'm going to tell you, like, I was trying to help the devil with, with his business. I was like, run, run. Oh, you, oh, you need a little something, something? All right, man, give me about 15, 20 minutes. Give me your stuff. You know, and I kind of like doing little deals like that for people. So I was literally using my members as weapons of warfare for unrighteousness and the kingdom of God. I was like a soldier working in the devil's playground. I was being utilized by him to be a soldier to bid his business. But I got good news for you that when you give your heart to the Lord and you begin to understand the things of God, now you can use your body parts as, in, as weapons of warfare for the things of God. Amen? That's a good thing. Praise God. I mean, look, I'm just saying, like, I mean, for me personally, I don't know if you completely agree with me or not on this, Rich, but, like, well, first of all, I just want to commend you because you picked some really good songs. Praise God. You always do that. But today, I'm just going to say it. I mean, I probably could have waited till later, but you're a big boy, and I know you can handle it. I felt the anointing of God on that. 
Amen. And I just want to encourage you with that because that wasn't just you up there today, brother. I mean, I know you're skilled and I know you got a great skill level, but not, but the Holy Spirit was moving through what you're doing. And that's a very, to me, that's a very awesome thing. Amen. And listen, and, but what I was going to say is I don't know what you would agree with in your past, but what I'm trying to say is, is that it's a beautiful thing if you used to play music in the world that you would play, at least in my opinion, that now you would play music in the church for the Lord. Amen. And, and so praise God, like, you know, your members, or our members are now can be are being switched as we move forward in the things of God and move towards we're becoming soldiers for the Lord instead of being soldiers for the enemy. So I just want to encourage you, don't yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin or unto unrighteousness, but yield your members as weapons of warfare for righteousness unto God. Amen. The same mouth that you used to use in the world, you can use for the glory and the kingdom of God. Amen. The same hands that you used to do whatever you used to do in the world, now you can use them. You can use them to build for God. You can use them. It's good stuff. Amen. Praise God. All right. So in Romans 6, 14, it says, For sin shall not have dominion over you. For you are not under the law, but under grace. I mean, these are the kind of verses that you probably just pass over and you may not really think a whole lot about it. So it's saying that sin shall not be your master. It's not going to be your Lord. Okay. Why? And it says it because it says right here, sin shall not lord over you. Sin shall not have dominion over you. Sin shall not be your king reigning over you. We could word it all like that. And then he says, for. So that's almost like saying, you could ask the question, why? And he's saying, because. You can, you can interchange for and because. Because you are not under the law, but instead you're under grace. See, that's the beauty of it. What you and I need to understand is that before Christ, or b- listen, before anyone is born again, whether or not they feel like they're practicing the law or not, the law is God's law. And it says, do this and live. And if you can't do it, it doesn't even matter if it's somebody in India. You understand that? Dude, this is some deep stuff, and I, don't, I didn't really plan on just going here, but... Danielle used to have an uncle that passed away, and he was a physicist that he got his degree from LSU, and he worked for NASA. And every year for Christmas, we would have conversations about the things of God, and he was an atheist. And so naturally, he's a lot smarter than I am, so I'd have to regroup every year and come back. And so also, Mr. Paul's brother was there, and they were tit for tat, and they were kind of like coming against a little bit, and he was kind of smart too. And But sometimes they would say some things that were really actually kind of good. And thought, I mean, when I say good, like kind of like stump me a little bit. I call that good because now, now I got to go back and I got to work on it a little bit. I got, see, that's the beauty of witnessing. If you just go out there and take a chance, the Lord will show up. And guess what? You might walk away from that thing feeling like you kind of got punched in the gut a little bit, but then you evaluate the situation and you do a little bit more research. Now you're armed and you're locked and loaded because I can promise you the Lord will bring another person like that in your path so that you can so that you can um, do it again. But this is what I was going to try to tell you, is that it doesn't matter where you go. People are going to be held accountable according to God's law. That may not make sense to you, but you're going to run into someone that's going to try to say to you, but the people in Nigeria that are living in the, or the people in the Amazon rainforest, they've never heard of the Lord, so how can God hold them accountable? Well, they said that one time at the, at the, at the Christmas dinner table. And I, and I looked to, to Danielle's uncle, and I said, well, sir, that's a good question you have. But just like you, you see, your sister got saved, and your sister told you about Jesus, and your sister told Mr. Paul about Jesus, and you rejected Jesus, and Mr. Paul accepted Jesus, and now Mr. Paul has offspring, and that many of them are serving the Lord. And you're, you have offspring, and ain't none of them serving the Lord. Now... You may feel as though, and I know that sounds harsh, but hey, look, if you're going to come against my Lord and we're going to sit here and have a civil debate, let's get it out. So the point that I'm trying to make, though, is that there's a wake that follows rejection, and there's a wake that follows acceptance. What are you talking about? Just like a boat going down the river leaves a wake and it spreads out? 
Whenever the gospel goes forward and people accept it, it doesn't just affect them, it affects everything around them. And it keeps growing that way. Whenever there's wicked leadership over nations and communism, listen, God's word's still been going forth since the beginning. God has always had a witness in the land. It's not his fault that the enemy through wicked men is trying to suppress the truth. The word of God says that God's wrath is poured out on on men that suppress the truth of God. When a man suppresses or rejects the truth of God, it does. It may prevent people from hearing the gospel, but that doesn't mean that God has not gone forward and allowed his word to go forward, that all men will be held accountable, and the law of God will judge all men because God gave his law to all men, and whether or not they, they receive it or not, or his word, right, but then this is the thing. So now in Christ, hallelujah, we we come under a new covenant. We come under grace. And the reality of it is this, is that you can't live. So if they're rejecting the gospel, or you can say that they never even heard of the the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I've already explained that to you. So that's not God's fault. God's, God's been having witnesses in the land from the beginning. Adam knew God, Seth knew God, but yet at the same time in the very beginning when there's just one man and one woman, if they reject the gospel, then it doesn't move forward. But yet if Seth accepted the gospel and he told his offspring and Noah after the flood told his offspring, there were people that received it and those people groups are blessed by it is my point. So so I just need you to understand is that the law has dominion over human beings whether they know about it or not, whether they want to believe it or not. It's God's earth. It's God's word. It's God's law. Amen. It's God's Jesus that he sent for us to die, and it's his grace that he produced for us through it. So you shall, sin shall not be your master. It's not going to be your Lord. It's not going to be your king. Why? Because you're not under law. You who have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior are not under law. Amen. You're under grace. There's people that constantly trying to put themselves under a system of law. Don't put yourself under law. Allow yourself to live under grace. Amen? Amen. Now, so I want you to see this right here, though. Look, the sting of of death is sin. Look at this. The strength of sin is the law. See, the law gives strength to sin. When you attempt to live for God under a system of rules or regulations— or you think you're going to make better, just make better decisions, you're just going to give power to sin. That's not how sin can be approached. That's not how the power of sin can be approached. The power of sin moving and operating your life has to be approached this way. Lord, I understand that I cannot overcome sin. I understand that in my own strength, I am weak to sin. Lord, I believe that you are the one that gives me victory over the power of sin. That's really what Romans 6 is talking about. That, but that this power is coming to you and I because literally, again, in the mind of God, the old man that used to be bound by all those things died in Christ, was buried with him, and a new man has been resurrected to newness of life. Those of you that have truly experienced grace flowing in your life in an area where you could not quit before, whatever that was, you know, whatever your little thing was, and you couldn't do it, even if you're doing it right now, I'm just saying, if you've ever felt the victory of, in your life, you know what I'm talking about. That, because you, that's what you call revelation. And if you've never experienced it in your life up to this point, you know what you got to do? What the Apostle Paul said, fight the good fight against sin, huh? That's what he said. Fight the good fight against sin. Is that what he said? No, that's not what he said. He said, fight the good fight of faith. Fight the good fight of faith. Well, what are you talking about, preacher? What is, what is faith? Faith in that what God said is what he meant. And faith, what did God say? He said, I so loved the world, I gave my only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What else did God say? Because uh, Jesus died unto sin once, but now that he died, he lives unto God. And what else did God say? Likewise, reckon yourself, therefore, to be dead unto sin, but alive unto God through Christ Jesus, your Lord. Hallelujah. Don't give strength to sin by embracing a system of law. In verse 16, he says, 
Know you not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Now, I just want to tell you, if you're going through something, I got to tell you that you got to be careful because, look, there's a difference between struggling and just, like, living in it. Because, look, the more you just live in it and you keep that door wide open, I mean, it's one thing whenever we've used the example before. For sake of brevity, I won't walk way over there to the door, though. But y'all see me do it. Like, we open up the door like we want to take a little peek. Let's see what's through there. Let's see if it's still the same or if it's a little bit different. And then we, like, barely put a little peek in there. And then the next thing you know, we go to call it. Oh, no, I feel guilty. Let me go ahead and close it. Boom! Too late. His foot's in the door. You gave the devil a foothold. And he ain't just going to let go that easily. Well, this is the thing, though. It's just like, okay, I just give in. I'm just going to give in and just, just let the door fling wide open. No, you do that, dude. Look, now you, you're yielding yourselves, and now you're becoming his servant again. You can't do that. No, you got to hold on to the Lord, man. You got you to gotta keep moving in the right direction. And I'm not ta- talking about for law. Oh, you, I thought you said I didn't have to come to church to get victory. Well, but no, th- coming to church is if your motives are wrong. Like, I'm going to go to church, and because I'm doing the right thing, God's going to give me victory. Wrong. You got a buzzer, press the buzzer. Eh, doesn't work like that, right? But where do people that love Jesus go? They go to church because why? Because the word of God said, forsake not the gathering of the brethren, right? You can, or your church could be the marathon. I'm just saying, like, that's another thing. While I was running, I'm like, dude, this is their church. <laughs> they've been practicing church, man. They've, they've been running. Look, this is their thing, bro. They, they coming together, and this is how they congregate. This is what they do. And there's other people, like the bar room is their church. I'm not going to talk about Robert's testimony, but he used to say, <laughs> well, he used to say, it with the, the places of ill repute that Rob hung out with. You can fill in the blanks yourself. But he said, why would I not pay tithes to the Lord? Lord knows I was paying tithes to the devil. As much money as, he was, as I was spending in them places, why would I not give my money to the Lord? Amen. Huh? Isn't that good? Oh, dude, but no, you're willing to spend money on your flesh, right? Make me feel so good. Yeah, let me just spend some more money on my flesh. But what about the spirit? Amen? Oh, hallelujah. If y'all know what I'm talking about. If y'all have been blessed by the Lord and you felt the Holy Spirit move in your heart before, you know what I'm talking about. Hallelujah. You can't outgive God. Amen? Amen. You can't outgive God. I just wish we all, I'm talking about me too, just without restraint could just that's, that's kind of what the book of Acts must have looked like, right? Without restraint. That's good. They just trusted the Lord. Yeah. They preferred their brothers and sisters over themselves. They gave of all that they had. They genuinely cared about their brothers and sisters. Amen? Amen. Praise God. So don't you know that who you yield yourself servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. I had a little graphic there, but you get the point. I think I was going to try to go backwards. Whom you obey, his servants you are. Yeah, you just read it backwards. Whom you obey, his servants you are. Sounds like Yoda, huh? All right, here we go. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. I know one time, like uh, I think Mike Landry and I talked about, how long you been coming to church here, Mike? You think, four, four years. When he first started coming, I remember me and him had a conversation. I think it was that guy, Paul Washer, or he was telling me that he would listen to Paul Washer. And I was like, man, I saw him on a video a while back, and it was him and several other people. And they were talking about this word doctrine, and they were exposing, like, Stephen Furtick and um, a bunch of them other guys, a bunch of those relevant modern-day preachers that everybody's going goo goo and gaga over right and and but what they were saying in this video they had clips of these guys saying things like take your doctrine and shove it where the sun don't shine i don't want to hear your stupid word doctrine anymore who cares about doctrine yeah (laughs) okay i guess paul did (laughs) and if paul cared about it that means the holy spirit cared about it Right, But they, they, I mean, just clip after clip after clip of them dogging preachers that talk about doctrine. Why do you want us to get rid of our doctrine, sir? Because you don't want to be called into question about the things that you do and the things that you're saying. Because the word doctrine right there literally means instruction. It means teaching, the teaching from God. And the apostle Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, would say, but God be thanked. See, he says, Whom you obey, 
his servants you are, but God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. Well, what form of doctrine did you deliver to the church in Rome, Paul? The same one I delivered to the church in Corinth. That, that the preaching of the cross is foolishness to them who perish, but unto us who are being saved, it is the power of God. It's the message of Jesus Christ and him crucified that says death to the old man born of Adam, new life to the new man resurrected in Christ. Sin is no longer your master, amen? But you gotta, you gotta, you gotta obey from the heart that form of doctrine. So what does it mean? It means to be able to believe. To be able to believe that what God says is true. That you can literally reckon yourself to be dead unto sin. I'm not, do you think I'm bringing strange fire up in this house? Because I'm telling you, I'm just reading right off the page. And I'm just trying to break it down for you. That you and I, as new creations in Christ, through the grace of the Holy Spirit. We already talked about that. Remember that, the whole dispenser of grace thing? You need to, clear, you know, the... Holy, the Holy Spirit is the dispenser, the sanitizer is grace, and Jesus is the purchase power that allowed the thing to be put on the wall to begin with. The cross. See, without the cross, the Holy Spirit's not moving. And so you need the Holy Spirit in your life. He wants to flow grace into that area of your life. He wants, listen, it's, a, it's whatever you need from God, it's the grace of God moving and operating in your life. Sometimes, but I need my children saved. Okay, well, until they get saved, the Lord wants to give you grace. Amen. Or, or or as you're praying for them, you're going to believe that it's the grace of the Holy Spirit. Again, I need you to understand grace is more than just forgiving power. Grace is, is God's changing power on the inside of a human heart or, on the in, or in the midst of a situation and a circumstance. I need grace in this area of my life. He will give it to you. The Holy Spirit will dispense it to you if it's grace that you need. For, for your life to walk in victory with the Lord, for your loved ones to be saved, but you, you and I still pray. We pray to ask the Lord to move in the midst of those situations. And until it happens, we're going to believe God until it happens. Amen? You gotta, we got to learn to believe God until it happens. And then guess what? If it never does happen or if the promise tarries, we're still gonna, he'll give you the grace that you need to continue on with the Lord, amen, until he comes back and takes us or until we go to, till we go to sleep in the Lord, amen. But grace is the change agent. Grace changes your heart. It changes your lips. It changes your mouth. It changes your words. It changes your thoughts. The grace of God moving and operating in your life can change your thoughts. That's powerful. That's powerful. Now, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that since I learned the message of the cross, I ain't never had a bad thought. Then I'd be a liar, and I'd need grace for that. I'd rather be truthful. But what I am trying to tell you is this, is that I have experience in my life almost the inability to think about anything good. Yeah, you know, probably not as bad as pre-flood stuff, but bad, to where my mind was a devil's playground, to where it was, I mean, just so much lust, so much stuff going on in my head, but I thank the Lord that when he showed up, I knew it was a work of the Lord. I knew it was grace. That's what I'm trying to say. I knew it was God showing up because the very thing I was trying to rebuke away, but just was staying there, it seemed like he was laughing, had to shut up and go bye-bye whenever the Lord showed up. And it's like, I don't even remember. God, God would do it in such a way that I couldn't even remember a specific circumstance, like to where I could have Oh, yeah, it was because I prayed on my knees in the corner at 5 o'clock in the morning, and that's when it happened. You see what I'm saying? Because Lord help us, but we probably would have started doing that. Every morning at 5 o'clock, let me get up, let me get on my knees in that corner of the room and let me pray again because that's where the victory came, so that must be the pathway to victory. Does that make sense? Because, listen, whenever the Lord first, I told you all, in the midst of my desperation after my sister had died, in great agony and desperation, I started to seek the Lord. And as I was seeking the Lord, I was gaining strength from God and becoming more and more on fire for the Lord. Listen, I was listening to preachers that nowadays I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend them to 
for nothing. But yet I was receiving stuff because they would give a little snippet of the Bible, and I didn't know enough about the Bible to catch the bad stuff. And I would, so the big stuff was just being there, and I was like, oh, man, the Lord's feeding me. Right, and but but what happened was is that I started getting up early in the morning. I was listening to that dude uh, Jonathan Stocksteel stuff, and he and he had a whole album full of different songs like "Lord Let It Rain" and just different stuff. I didn't even. I, I mean, I used to sit in a church service and I would try to lift my hands. But look, the Lord taught me how to pray and how to praise and how to worship in that living room. Uh, uh, amen. I can't remember who I was talking to yesterday. I was talking to somebody, or no, today, or maybe it was Taylor. I, I can remember talking and saying, dude, my prayer life changed. My prayer life used to be, Lord, I need you to do this. And listen, you're still supposed to bring your needs before the Lord. But what I'm trying to say is my prayer life changed. It went from everything being all about me and God giving me what I needed to thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Like a genuine heart of understanding what he had done for me. And out of a heart of gratitude, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord, use me to bless you. Lord, what can I do? It's a silly question for a man to ask, but yet I asked it none the same. Lord, what can I do for you now? How can I repay you, Lord? <laughs> How can I repay you for what you've done for me? And the Lord would say, you can't, you can't repay me. But I laid my life down so you could live, so now I need you to lay your life down so you can live for me. See, use your life. Use your members as instruments of righteousness. Amen? Now, listen, whenever we're getting into, so what I was trying to show you is, is that form of doctrine. And I used a bunch of scriptures to describe that. But real quick, let's look at these scriptures here. Colossians 2.14 says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. What, what do you think that that ordinance is, is talking about right there? Anybody want to take a wild stab at it? Y'all done heard me teach this scripture a thousand times. What is that word ordinance is talking about? Law, thank you. Talking about the law. So God blotted out the handwriting of the law that was against us. Why was it against us? Because it called us guilty, right? Because we're all guilty, because we all fall short. It was contrary to us. Why was it con what does contrary mean? It means it's against you. Why was it against me? Because you wasn't doing it. So you was guilty. And he took it out of the way. How did he do it? He nailed it to his cross. I want you to see that. Now, this is the next verse. And having spoiled, I, now I love this, in, the, in Kenneth Weiss' Greek commentary, he makes the point that what this word describes, and I've shared this with y'all before, is like when the Roman Empire would defeat another nation or empire, what they would do is they would strip the, the officers of all of their, their uniform and all of their medals, and they would parade the, the officers and they would bring them back to Rome, and they would make them walk through the streets of Rome. And the way it was built, it was obviously built high up, and the people would be up on the, and, and, and everybody would just be screaming because of the triumph that their, that their nation had, had accomplished. And so basically what this is saying is, is that Jesus did that to the principalities and powers. You need to understand, what is that word principalities and powers talking about? Fallen angels. In our book study, our book club, <laughs> it's called the Elohim, right? Little G, little gods, but it's angels of various circumstance and various uh, hierarchical levels, demonic spirits, whatever they may be, principalities and powers. It's wicked authorities that are against the things of God. But look what Jesus did. He made an open show of them triumphing over them in it. But I want you to see that, that word it right there. That's actually a pronoun. The word, pro, the word it is a pronoun. Now, I want you to see something. I wanted to bring you to verse 13 because I want to go backwards a little bit. So let's go. This is Colossians 2. Here you go. Like, I just want you to see the whole thing in tandem. And you being dead in your sins, you see, that was you before. You remember all those other, sin was reigning in your life. Sin was your king. He was your Lord. He had dominion over you. That's where you used to be. You were dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh. Dude, is that not good to know, understand the Old Testament? And to understand that circumcision was a sign of the covenant that God had with his people. And to understand that now in the New Testament, Christian is God's people. And to understand that the scripture would talk about an uncircumcision of your flesh. What does that mean? You're walking outside of covenant. The idea is, is that you're not walking in covenant relationship with God. Amen. And, 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 and now this is a spiritual circumcision. 
right? The circumcision of the heart that takes place by the Spirit of God as the grace of God is applied to your heart. And look what he says. He says, he has quickened together with him, having forgiven you all your trespasses. Now, one of the things that I wanted you to see is that, is that right here, this pronoun here, he, he. You can see it right there. He has quick, but look at this. So then we get back into verse 14. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us. He took it out of the way. He nailed it to his cross. Having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Now, I did that for a purpose, <coughs> two purposes. Number one, I wanted you to see verse 13. I wanted you to see how you were dead in sin, hallelujah, but he made you alive when he forgave you. Okay, so I wanted you to see that. But then the other thing I wanted you to see is I wanted you to take notice of the word cross right there, and I wanted you to take notice of the word it right here. Because you see, the word it is a pronoun, but it's reflecting, it's going back to the word cross. But now I want you to show, I want to show you something. Now, y'all know I've been using the ESV, and I know some of y'all think I'm a heretic. And I've also been using the NASB, and I know some of y'all think I'm a heretic for that. But look, sometimes the King James nails it. Sometimes these other ver versions have, have the idea that's even more understandable, and it's the truth. But I want to show you this right here. Look at this. See, you got to be able to compare. You, that's part of your study. And it doesn't mean that, I, and listen, I always stick to literal translations, me personally, as much as I can. Uh, the, the ESV, the NASB, the King James Bible. But look, canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. You see that? See, to me, I kind of don't really like that. <laughs> I'm just going to be honest with you. And you're going to find things that you don't like sometimes whenever you use other translations. But I don't like the word Easter in the King James Bible. I know, crickets. I don't like it. And I wish it wasn't there. Because Easter comes from Ishtar. So don't tell me that the translation is perfect. All right. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them having triumphed over them through him. Now, we understand that Jesus' cross is part of who he is, or at least the work of what he did. Amen? We understand that. But I got a problem with this. Why are we using the pronoun him whenever in the other verse it explains to us very distinctly that it was the word it because it was describing the cross? That was the last noun that was used. We'd have to go all the way back to chapter to verse 13 to find the pronoun he, and we can assume we know who he's talking about. We're talking about Jesus. But really and truly, I'm just trying to let you know, what is the big deal here, Matt? Are you trying to do a grammar lesson? or ver No, I'm trying to make a point. The power of the cross. I'm trying to make a point that Jesus was without sin. Yeah, we understand that. Jesus was without sin. Jesus was a great teacher. I mean, dude, he taught some deep stuff about the kingdom of God when he got into the parables. Jesus was an awesome teacher. Jesus was a miracle worker. Amen. He healed the sick, the lame, got up and walked, the dead rose, the deaf heard. We understand these things. But if Jesus don't go to the cross, you and I are still dead in our sin. If Jesus doesn't pay the penalty of the cross, you and I are still dead in our sin and we don't have access to grace to walk in victory. Amen. I hope that makes sense. Praise God. All right. We're about to close up here. Rich, you want to come play us another song while we get ready to close, if you don't mind? We're going to close out in a song. We're going to worship the Lord. Amen. But look, Romans 6 and 22 says this. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. You know what the Apostle Paul is saying? Listen, Jesus died on the cross to sever sin's rulership over you. And now through the grace of God, you have the power in you to be a servant to the Lord and that the fruit that comes out of your life can lead unto holiness and everlasting life. And then we end with this. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As they begin to play this last song, let's just thank the Lord for what he's done in our hearts and in our lives. Amen.